Hi, everyone. I'd like to do a shout out to our sponsor, Baco Diagnostics. Early detection is the single most important factor in improving patient outcomes. The Baco Diagnostics team recognizes how impactful a podiatric physician can be and remains committed to supporting you in your role as the first line of defense in diagnosing conditions of the lower extremity. Thanks to the unwavering support of our clients, Baco Diagnostics has been able to give back to the podiatric community for 16 years by providing podiatric educational resources and advocating for the profession. Baco Diagnostics, helping podiatric physicians keep America on its feet. If you have not yet had the opportunity to utilize Baco Diagnostics services, get started today by sending an email to corporate relations at bacodx.com. The first 50 podiatry offices who request a starter kit will receive a Dean's Chat mug. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Dean's Chat, where we discuss all things podiatric medicine. My name is Dr. Jeffrey Jensen. I'm the Dean at the Arizona College of Podiatric Medicine and the host for the Dean's Chat podcast. Once again, I'm joined by my co host, Dr. Joanna Ritchie. Hi, Joe. Hey, Jeff. How are you doing? I am doing fabulous. I'm super excited about today's episode. We are joined by Dr. Michael Dugella. Dr. Dugella, welcome to Dean's Chat. I'm super happy to be here. Really appreciative of the opportunity to sit and spend some time visiting with you. And I've uh, watched this program with interest, and uh, it's just an honor. Well, we're glad you're here. And if it's okay with you, let's go with first names, Michael, Joe, and Jeff. It sounds perfect. Thanks. You're welcome. Well, Mike, thank you so much for taking time. I mean, somebody who is involved in just about every arm of our profession, I really appreciate you taking the time to come and talk with us and our audience about your experiences. Uh, Just to give a a brief bio, and then we'll kind of dig a little bit into your experiences as we go. Uh, But Dr. Dugella graduated with his Bachelor's of Science from BYU, then went on to do some graduate studies in the field of genetics at Westchester University in Pennsylvania. Went on to do his podiatric medical school in Ohio with uh, Kent State University and completed his resident surgical residency training with University Hospitals Health System, Southwest General in Cleveland, Ohio. And I would love to um, go through a little bit more about your fellowship experience. But first, I'd, I'd like to give the opportunity for you to talk about your own career and kind of what led you down the course of fellowship and now being a fellowship director at the Advanced Surgical Foot and Ankle Fellowship in Washington Orthopedic Center. Uh, in Olympia, Washington, but I'll, I'll hand the mic back to you. Yeah, thanks, Joe. You know that's a that's a long discussion. Um, what starts, I think, ultimately was how did I how did I get into this field to begin with? And uh, you know, I was born with a club foot, and so I've <clears throat> had successful surgery as a kid and was able to go on and play hockey and soccer at a pretty competitive level. And uh, you know, just felt super thankful and appreciative for for the people who, who came before me and were able to help me and. You know, I just wanted to be able to give back. And I went through my training and had it. I feel like a really fortunate opportunity to train with uh, Rick Zerm and Jim Polfinger out at um, Southwest General Frank Fargo, and then also Gerard Yu, whom I had the you know distinct honor of spending a lot of time with in his office from the time I was a first year student on. And he was one of our attendings in the program. And, you know, I did this program and finished with a little around somewhere around 1400 procedures in my residency program. And I felt what I thought was pretty good honestly, at that time, but, you know, graduating in 2002 from residency, that was kind of a, an interesting era. There was a lot of changes coming about. Um, external fixation, for example, was just starting and becoming in vogue. People like, you know, uh, Bob Mendocino and um, George Vito and, and people of the like were really just starting to do a lot. And and so I didn't get a ton of exposure other than some, some frames for trauma. So that that was one area where I felt like I was lacking a little bit. And then, of course, at that time, we didn't have a lot of patient-specific anatomic implants or anatomically designed implants. We were relying more on things like one-third tubular plates you know, for first MTP fusions or cross screws, very simple technology that worked. But nevertheless, that wasn't part of my wheelhouse. You know, If we wanted something tricky, we'd use cranial maxillofacial plates, which were not perfect in that solution. And then as this expanded, you know, there's just more and more evolution. A lot of things changed at that time. So I felt that in the first sort of six years of my practice, I was comfortable, but I wasn't super comfortable. You know, a lot of these cases would eat at me. I'd sit there on the weekends and worry, did I make the right decision? And, you know, you can chalk some of that up to just pure inexperience, right? Uh, But I think, honestly, I, I felt like I needed more. I didn't just, you looked at some of my colleagues who 
they just didn't have the same worries that I had about things. And uh, it's, it wasn't anything about being lackadaisical. It's just they had a different level of comfort from their training program. And I'm eternally grateful to the people who train me, but I just felt like I needed a little bit more. And so I started to look at opportunities in 2008. And at that point, just slightly before 2007, I'd applied for um, an AO fellowship. And that was granted uh, at that time, I was very fortunate to do it because they usually would take, you know, four or five people a year. And the thing is, they grant them well ahead of time. So that was, I think, in I think about 18 months ahead of time or so. It was quite quite a while down the road. So my goal was to do something in 2008. And I started reaching out to kind of who I knew to be world leaders in Germany and Switzerland. So I found that there were certain things that I wanted to learn more about. Um, there were little pockets like cartilage was, you know, a new issue where we were dealing with, you know, advanced technologies uh, for, for you know, OCDs and things that we didn't have as easy an access to in the U.S., things like Macy and, and other technologies like that, stem cell type stuff early on. Um, so I started to identify these people, and then I used that as kind of a leapfrog. So I would identify one one person, and I'd say, I'd contact the next and say, hey, I'm coming over to spend some time with so-and-so. Can I come and spend some time with you? And so I ended up um, in 2008 spending time in, I think it was six cities and 10 hospitals with, you know, a little over 20 different people. And it was a great time. I was able to take my wife and my my young son. He was about a year at the time and to go over. And, and we actually stayed with families while we did that, um, kind of hosted through our church, which was kind of a nice cultural experience as well rather than just staying in hotels the same time. It was just, you know, many, many months. It was too expensive to try and stay in hotels that whole time. So got to know people and now lifelong friends. In fact, at ACFAST last year, uh, almost our entire Flatfoot people were people that I trained with during that period of time. So it's nice to see that come full circle. 2009, I went and did the uh, AO Fellowship with Biet Hinterman. Um, and many of you know, he's kind of a world guru in total ankle. And that was something, you know, we just had no exposure to total ankle during my training. And it was something I was really interested in. So I was able to go over and spend some time with him as an AO fellow and get lots of very unique experience. The fellowship through AO, having the ability to be shoulder to shoulder with somebody who'd really stacked the deck in anticipation of somebody coming with some really interesting cases. That was really fortuitous. And then in 2012, I was fortunate enough to, to go to Orthopedic Foot and Ankle Center and you know, spent several months with Chris Heyer, Greg Burlett, uh, Terry Philbin, and Tom Lee, who, you know, Chris actually was a classmate of mine, and uh, you know, I consider him to be just one of the greatest people in the world, I mean, on so many levels, and and all of them, I feel that way. I was still very close with all of them. So that all culminated with, um, you know, a much better sense of comfort and an opportunity to kind of further get involved in teaching and things through the connections you make, because let's face it, you know, um, you need a connection in this profession to be able to make that next step and to get involved in some of the other things. So that was kind of a long, long, long winded explanation. I apologize. But... No, and, and and I, I appreciate you, you giving it because I can read these things off, but I think they carry so much more impact when you can describe it. Um, Cause again, some of the things that I found interesting that I kind of knew about you, but until you had sent me your CV, piecing all of that out. Like I knew you had gone over your internationally and done uh, the AO fellowship, but I had not realized how extensive, it, I mean, you, we have seen several faculty who have talked about their AO experience and overwhelmingly it's been incredible experiences they've had, but to have the multi-center, like how you had had it set up again, I just thought that was incredibly unique. So thank you for, for Thanks. elaborating on that. My, yeah, my... You know, I think that's what made it interesting to me was <clears throat> to work with different mindsets, different people with different interests and different backgrounds. You know, a sports medicine center, for example, in Heidelberg, I was just back a few weeks ago and just stopped in to say hi, you know, unannounced. It was kind of great to see people from years ago, but working with professional athletes, you know, Anna Kornikova, you know, world famous tennis player had just had surgery there before I came. So, you know, everybody's got their little unique niches and being able to kind of pick the brains of all these people who'd been in practice for a long time at a high level, I just... It's it was an irreplaceable experience for me. Super grateful for that. Changed my life. Hundred hundredfold changed my life. Mike, I have a question for you. I am so impressed that you got out of your residency training in two thousand two, and six years later you put that experience together in Europe. And you said you felt like you needed more, and and but the process of 
it's one thing to think you need more, and it's another thing to go out and make it happen. Um, talk about uh, psychologically. Uh, how was that? I mean, that that was a big jump, and I and I I'm impressed uh, to no end. No, I appreciate it. You know what? I I mean, um, it was super engaging for me. It was a it was a you know a, a challenge to try and put this together. Can I get these people to take somebody that they don't know from Adam? Can can I make this happen? Can I piece this all together? Because you know, logistically, you know, with vacations and different things going on, it, it makes it a little bit of a challenge. But ultimately, without the support of my family, number one, there was absolutely no way that could ever happen. Now, I'm sure many of you can imagine going to your spouse and saying, hey, we're moving to Europe for half a year. And, you know, um, we're going to live with people that we don't know and in different homes and be in and out of, you know, care, living out of suitcases for. So ideally, you know, we, we try to schedule two to three weeks at a time with each place and sometimes more, sometimes less, but, you know, I mean, it, it, it was a huge challenge for my wife and I'm eternally grateful for that. Um, so yeah, it's, it was just really a sense of excitement. And, and another person that, you know, has, has passed on, but I have to acknowledge is John McCord, who was my partner at the time, um, you know, that he was willing to, to spare me to go. It was a huge, huge thing for him to let me take off and run the whole practice and cover call during that time. So and then subsequently, James Prestridge, who was my associate, um, who was there when I was um, gone down to, or for, for part of that, and then uh, another uh, young man who was covering for a while as well when I was um, gone for the AO fellowship. So again, without people covering my patients, my you can't just leave, you know, let's face it, we've got, we've got responsibilities, and you can't check out for months and months at a time. So I owe everybody for this. This is a, a huge collective effort. Let me ask one more question, Joe. Uh, Mike, what was the re-entry like? I mean, you go there and you spend all that time and you assume and accumulate all this knowledge and skill and you walk back into the same office that you had left. What was that like? What was the patient experience like? What was your, how was your skill set different and your confidence? That's a great question. I mean, I think that the staff was excited by some of the new things that we were introducing. You know, I think initially there's sort of a sense of being a little overwhelmed by all the changes, right? Because there were there were a number of different things. But, you know, I was cognizant about trying not to overdo it initially and just try to step into this slowly, this reentry, as you say, just so that, you know, people, I could show them the skills I had and, you know, generate confidence in my referring providers and the local physicians. And, uh, you know, I, I really think that being part of the orthopedic group I'm in now, uh, that would not have been possible prior to this. Yeah. So I think that that, you know, changed the whole trajectory of my career. I think that's a beautiful segue. If you don't mind talking about what, what that transition looked like and, um, and then kind of building into uh, the collaboration that you had with Byron Hutchinson's program and then fostering now in you developed your own fellowship program his is now retired so if you don't mind yeah. kind of going through some of that yeah, for sure advice. for sure so I'd, I'd worked kind of in tandem side by side this orthopedic group and you know everybody was good relations but they were doing their thing I was doing mine they didn't have a foot and ankle person and you know by nature of just being in a little bit of a smaller city you sort of glean a lot of the referrals anyway because that's what you do is foot and their you know hip and knee and shoulder and, and all the other stuff so we always had great relations but um i think that once i came back they they kind of knew and there was an article in the paper and they'd read some of the things i was involved in and more and more discussions ensued and you know pretty soon i was actually talking with another larger orthopedic group um, who was also kind of on the fringe and connected with some of the people this is 2012 and i think that they just sort of were like hey maybe we could make something work together you know, obviously you're offering some things that we don't have right now, and that'd be a niche for our practice. So um, again, I think that that changed the trajectory of my career. We were able to to do that. And I'm uh, thankful to them that they made that happen because I had my own practice, you know, and I was still in the midst of a buyout and, and paying for this practice and I had to continue to do that. Actually, interestingly, for over a year after joining this orthopedic group, I was still buying out my old practice and at which I honestly, I just walked away from and closed, if you can imagine wasn't able to sell it and really didn't try because I'd be creating my own competition. So, you know, a lot of money put aside there that I never retained back. But you know what, again, I wouldn't have changed that whole path for anything. And, you know, coming to work here, I started in 2014 and had not had really any interest in doing a fellowship involved in academics and things and different things through organizations and meeting with ACBAS and such. 
And it was something that people, when the fellowship initiatives came out, that people were contacting saying, have you ever thought about a fellowship? And, you know, I just, I'm not teaching residents. We're nowhere near a residency program. So I thought, I, I don't know, do I have anything to teach? Would I be a teacher? And so I just sort of continued along the act fast. And as I got more and more involved in that and more involved in teaching, I realized how much I enjoyed it. And then I had a one of Steinberg's residents actually um, come out and spend a month who was from Seattle. He's like, hey, can I, can I shadow you? Can I come spend a month? I thought, wow, that's great. It's like kind of an externship. And he said, you know, you really should have a fellowship here. This is a, you know, a very busy practice. We do, you know, 80, 90 ankle fractures a year, lots of good stuff in the middle of nowhere. And you know, weird pathology comes out of the hills. And so I started to think about that, you know, I think that might be a fun thing to do. And so thankfully, again, thanking my partners, they had a huge vision for that and actually helped fund. We all split the cost of the fellow equally. Uh, despite the fact that, you know, while they scrub with the other guys as well a little bit, it's really my expense and that's how much they believe in it. And they've been incredibly helpful and, uh, you know, working with Byron. So we were kind of running our programs in tandem. Byron's probably about an hour away. And we thought, you know, it might be great to do that swap because I'm not doing any diabetic foot in my program, no Sharko. And so that just was a natural uh, sort of exchange, which was tough, right? Because these guys had to get fully credentialed uh, to be able to scrub at those hospitals. And that's a big deal because it's a, an hour away. It's not like they were going to get credentialed and scrub there for a year. I mean, they're doing it for a month, basically. So it would take them months and months and months to, to get this all set up. And then they would come and spend the month down here and sometimes drive back and forth. It was a bit crazy, but really a super uh, exciting experience. And had the opportunity, Joe, to work with Lindsay Yelm, who you met this weekend and spent some time with. She's an up and coming star. And you know, just it's just a phenomenal thing, I think, to see the progression of these young people and what they're coming out with. It's just light years ahead of what I came out with. Absolute light years. Yeah. It, you know, it is really funny too. It like also what a small world. So she is now in practice with the resident that came from Hutch's program down to work with Shoebirth when I was the chief resident. So like, right? Like, this is incredible. Like yeah, the more you talk work. to people, it's like the seven degrees of separation. So anyway, such, such a salt, fun, small world. And, and I love that you bring up some of the points about credentialing. Cause I think the other thing that's so easy to sometimes forget is, and as you and I can talk to, as we go into other parts of your leadership career, how much work goes on behind the scenes that it's not just so easy as to be like, Oh, well, let's just go spend a month over here and let's just send you over there for two weeks. And let's do, there is a lot of logistical work that goes into getting these things set up. Um, can you talk a little bit about, um, you know, fellowship is a hot topic and I'm, and I'm yeah. sure that Jeff, I'd love to get your input on this in just a second, but when we, when, when students and residents are looking, cause we have students already asking us about fellowship, what are some ways that uh, a resident or a student can start looking at different fellowship programs? I literally had a student or a resident ask me, what are red flags? And maybe that's not the way to approach this topic, but what are the recommendations that you would give as, as residents are looking at these different opportunities? Yeah. What are the things you think they should be looking at? Oh, that's a great question. We could talk for hours about this. I'm really passionate about this topic. So first off, going to Ohio for fellowship was probably one of the most challenging because that took six or eight months of prep. I had to get the state license. I had to go through trying to find my old exam results, which were years ago, yeah. you know, and then get credentialed on all the insurances, right? So yep. that, that took months and months and I'm thankful to them for helping me through that. Uh, and I think the biggest thing is, is trying to identify your fellowship and lock down a position as soon as possible, because, you know, in many cases, our fellows get hired on here and then they're not credentialed with insurances for a while. Okay. And if I happen to be out and they want to see patients, sometimes they can't see certain people because they're not on insurances. It can take you six plus months to get on an insurance plan. So the earlier you get signed up, the better, get your contract signed, you know, get started on that, getting your state license, you know, getting ready to roll. Because a lot of them, until you have your state license, you can't get hospital privileges. You can't get on insurance panels. I think even Medicare. So we've got insurance credentialing people that help with that. But, you know, if your fellow is not uh, kind of engaged in that process and helping along, that can be really a financial impact. And particularly, you know, we'll talk a little bit about my view on what how we use fellows, but particularly where you at least have to try to break even on the cost of your fellows. You know, if you're not billing, I think one of our first fellows, we didn't have some of the insurances till like seven or eight months in, like, you know, you can end up a little bit upside down on that. 
which is okay. That's not why we get into this, but you want to at least try to make it even, particularly in our case where my partners are, you know, paying out of their pocket to have a fellow here, orthopedic surgeons. So um, what else? Well, I think that the fellows, prospective fellows should be visiting if possible. Some programs don't accept uh, visitors. We have traditionally not, but we're going to start just because my main thrust behind not accepting, accepting them was I just always felt super guilty about people coming across the country to visit. And, you know, I, I thought I was being, you know, careful and protective of their funds, but many of them have told me, they're like, yeah, you know, I really would have loved to visit just to know what I'm getting into. Is that a place really that would match my needs? So thinking about, hey, not, you know, draining someone financially by having to fly all the way across the country and stay in a hotel, this, that, and the other can cost thousands. So I would guess that visiting is important. I would be cautious about how you plan those so that maybe you get the best bang for your buck. Maybe there's a couple of programs you can visit simultaneously in the region um, so that you're not spending so much money. I would talk to people who have completed fellowships. I would listen very, very carefully to what people tell you, okay? Um, rumor travel or, you know, news travels fast as to what a good fellowship and a bad fellowship is and what a good and bad fellowship are very different depending on whom you talk to and what your goals are, right? Whether you want a heavy clinic fellowship or a heavy, you know, surgical fellowship, uh, diabetes, total ankle, that's going to vary from program to program. And there are very few programs that provide all of that. So you have to make sure that it matches your, your needs and your desires. I would be careful about figuring out who you're working with. Uh, does the does the relationship ma match because that's such a close working relationship like our my fellow and I we, we're together like 12 hours a day for an entire year you know yes he does out rotations and covers other cases but I can be tough Joe can tell you I can be tough right and I think you want to be able to make sure that your personalities match so listen what past fellows experience have been have you been abused you know do they do they you know treat you badly? Do they not respect that you have some free time and you're off call? Um, are they demanding, you know, ridiculous amounts of outside work from you? Are they telling you to come over and wash your car? You know, it's, you know, the not being silly, but there's some crazy stories out there. And ultimately, not every fellowship's a good fellowship. Okay. And I think you'll hear if you talk to people that there are some fellowships out there, unfortunately, that probably um, have got people in there working for them that just purely want to put them to work and need a helper. But I think by and large, people mean very well, but you just have to know what you're getting into. Um, my, my personal, I don't know if you want me to get into this, but my, how do we run our fellowship? What am I looking for? What do I want to accomplish with a fellow? So my goal is to try and advance them about a minimum five to 10 years into practice. And what I mean by that is I spent the first several years trying to figure out when should I see a patient back? You know, um, when do I need to worry about this, the look of this wound? And some of that takes years to develop because of the volume or whatever it may be that you don't see the same things over and over. And it takes time to get that pattern recognition. And so it's helpful when a fellow is with you to be able to say, hey, you know what, that looks really bad, but guess what? I've seen that a thousand times. And this is, I think, how this is going to progress and what we're going to see with this. So that even though they may not have seen that exact thing a hundred times, they've had me to work with, you know, day in, day out to tell them, hey, you worry about this. You notice how, you know, they responded to you when you said this to them. So it's not just about clinical medicine. It's about interacting with people, you know, and trying to figure out what the best way to kind of bridge gaps in communication styles and mold. Because think about it, you go into one room, you're talking with one person, their next personality is completely different. So just learning how how to manage patient expectations and you know be respectful to people and and grow. But our goal is we see the patients together. And some people say, well, that's terrible. You know, a fellow needs to work alone. I feel like if the patient is seen by the fellow and then I see them together, I tell them, I ask him what would he do. I say, okay, this I agree with that, or I think we might consider this. Then we go through the whole perioperative period watch all the through the post-op period. We see the complications together. We learn how to manage them together, how to develop a confident style of communicating with the patient when there is an issue, making sure that you're not ignoring them, communicating with the family, and then not only developing surgical skills, but patient management skills. So the way I look at it is like grabbing their hand as they enter, you know, taking their other hand and then gradually just kind of le le letting go of them and they sail off. And I can tell you the three that we've had, we're on our fourth, 
are absolutely crushing it in practice. They're like, you know, I, I feel like so comfortable and I didn't realize what I didn't know because they all came from great programs, but you know, there's, there's more to know. And the difference it obviously is residency training, you know, where you're here one day and you're over there the next day and it's with Bill this day and Bob that day, you don't get that consistent sort of handholding. You know, I would never have thought that I needed a fellowship in training. We did so much surgery at such a high level but what I realized, we didn't have a fellow, we, we didn't have a residence clinic. I mean, we were with our attendings and it's very different when you're seeing the patient. So they do work alone. If I'm not here, for example, if I'm out for a meeting, they will see patients alone. They do some cases alone, but I try to scrub with them as much as I can just so that we can, you know, bounce ideas off each other and talk through things. So again, forgive me for a long-winded explanation. I thought it was great, Mike. Um, it's interesting that you said it projects them forward five to 10 years. I've used that same thought process in talking to residents when they've asked me what my opinion is. I, I've always used five years as an example because you're going to get smashed into that short period of time. Big cases that it would take forever for you on your own to accumulate. But the key yep. is if ever, because like you said, it was life changing maybe some of these res fellows would never have done any of those cases had they not come to your program. Maybe, you know, I they work with an orthopedic foot and ankle surgeon uh, with myself and one other fellowship trained guy, and we all are quite different in the way we approach things. So I think that's been really great too, is I, I would be careful to look at a program that has number one, five days a week in surgery. I think that balance is really key. A couple of days in surgery, a couple of days in clinic. Uh, and then I would also be careful not to have too many attendings because otherwise it's just a residency recreated, I think. I think you need this really close mentorship model where, where you know, you're working side by side routinely day in, day out. I think that's been an interesting thing as we've been interviewed several different fellowship directors, that that part, that relationship part, and to your point, Mike, that I think is actually a really good one that, that often gets forgotten. When you're in residency and you're seeing, it's wonderful to see six different surgeons way of doing surgery X and the way that they consider different things. But the thing that's hard about that is then when you come out and you're trying to translate that into real practice, well, what does that mean? Like, what do I do? Because I saw six different ways to do it. And while it's nice to have um, diversity, it can leave a lot of, to like your point, I just felt less secure. Like, I don't know what the right one, and it's not that there's yeah. a right or a wrong, but being able to be consistent with someone. And it's not that you have to go through residency all over again, but to your point, this is just to get a different experience, to get a refined experience. I think there's so much value in that. And I know certainly, and I'll speak only to my own experience and I won't project onto anyone else, I, I had brought up fellowships and I had several faculty discourage it because the idea was you don't need a fellowship. Yeah. And so again, when you're young and you're impressionable, it's like, okay, you're right. Like maybe that's not something that I need, but it's not necessarily need based. It's an in, like, I want to do to your point, like yeah. a couple of years later, and it's like, this is something that I feel like I want to do that I would encourage residents that it's, it's okay to look at it from a perspective that's not need based. You, you came out with plenty of numbers, plenty of experience. I want a different experience or I want a very, you know, singular, you know, more one on one relationship experience and then catapult you into what will kind of transition into is uh, opportunities in the career or in the profession. Uh, but before we do that, Jeff, I'm going to I'm going to see if you wanted to do a quick shout out to our sponsor as we talk about leadership opportunities. Absolutely. A quick shout out to our sponsor, Baco Diagnostics. We all know that early detection is the most important determination in improving patient outcomes. Baco Diagnostics remains committed to supporting you in your role as the first line of defense in diagnosing lower extremity pathologies. Baco Diagnostics, helping podiatric physicians keep America on its feet. Yeah, Baco has been so good to all of us, Mike, over the years, not only in the educational realm, but postgraduate education. Uh, thanks for giving us a chance to do a shout oh, out. Oh, for sure. Them. Yeah, it's very indebted to them. I've, uh, I've used some of their products and uh, certainly thankful to them. Thank you for sponsoring. Absolutely. Thank you, Baco. I'm sorry, Joe, carry on. Yeah. So, Mike. So you your... are the first person to say that and that I'm going to use going forward if I can steal that and give credit. It's not a needs-based thing. Yeah. I think that's perfect. That's very well said. I think that is a, ref a refinement. That's a way to say it. I think it's a polishing year. It's a transition year. 
that helps make that abrupt change from from residency to practice a lot softer. I'm, I'm curious your take as you interview a lot of applicants uh, because we certainly we just came back from the AO basic course and we had some practicing surgeons that were there and they are wanting to start doing different things or take on new op opportunities. And so I'm curious what your take is on when you're looking at different applicants, um, someone that's fresh out of residency versus someone that maybe has been in practice and is wanting to develop a new skill set. What does that look like in terms of being an applicant or what are some things that can help strengthen you? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, based on my own personal experience, I would certainly not be opposed at all to somebody who's been in practice, uh, who's looking to do more or get a better uh, expansion of their skill set, wanting to to be involved in some different things they hadn't have previous exposure to. Uh, in terms of prep from a resident standpoint, you know, we we do some research, we do a little bit of everything. It's just a very busy clinical fellowship. You know, they they do eight hundred odd uh, procedures while they're here and see about forty five hundred to five thousand clinic patients. So I want somebody honestly when I'm looking at an applicant, I'm looking for someone who's okay with working hard, but I don't live to work. You know, I work to live. I'm involved in a lot of things. My family is very important to me. So this is not a 24-hour day fellowship. Um, it, I'm looking for someone who's very independent because they have to be able to function uh, alone quite well because we are gone quite a bit with some of this educational stuff we're involved in. I think that the applicant, as long as they've done a good residency program, I feel like with the right attitude, I can train virtually anyone. You know, I I enjoy kind of working with different personalities and people from different backgrounds. You know, my first uh, my first fellow was uh, Taiwanese. My second fellow was uh, Indian. My third fellow was Korean. And my current fellow is a Caucasian guy from Ohio. So I've taken people from all kinds of diverse backgrounds. And I tell you, um, I've learned a little bit about every one of them and their backgrounds have, have um, I guess, sort of made me a better person. Um, so we take people from all over, all races, creeds, you know, all backgrounds educationally as well. Um, happened that we took a couple of people from Grant because, you know, they're like, hey, uh, you should look at my co-resident. Co he was fantastic and turned out to be that way. So um, I guess what I would say is read, um, learn how to do basic research, uh, meet as many people as you can talk to people, reach out to programs, talk to their fellows. That's really one of the biggest things is just talk to the current and past fellows. If they won't give you contacts on past fellows, you're going to you're gonna get a, a glowing endorsement or a lukewarm one. And I think you can tell who's being truthful with you. So I don't know if that answered your question. It did. Yeah. Thank you. As we transition then into some of the leadership roles that you've carried in our, and continue to carry in our profession. Um, you've sat on the board of directors for the American Board of Foot and Ankle Surgery and currently the president-elect um, with the American College of Foot and Ankle Surgeons. You are the chairman for the annual scientific conference that's going to be held in Phoenix uh, this coming March. Um, internationally, you've given a ton of different international lectures. Um, you've also served as the president, sorry, past chairman for the National Educational Scientific Affairs Committee with American College of Foot and Ankle Surgeons. Yeah. And then you've been a, one of the driving forces for this um, AO Foundation collaboration with the American College of Foot and Ankle Surgeons. Can you talk a little bit about what your experience, uh, how you got involved and what your take is on, um, you you started this conversation as you need connections to to build your career. Can you talk a yeah. little bit about what that looked like for you? Yeah, for sure. Thanks, and and kudos to you, and and all credit to to you, Joe Ritchie, for everything you've done for AO. Because you know this is a huge team effort. There's no I. This is all we. You know, Ron Ray, Graham Hamilton, Lawrence Ford, Motley. You know, Quasi Quadu, Christy King. This list goes on and on and on. Uh, that's been one of the pinnacle involvements in my career. I think. Uh, is getting that back to fruition and all of us making that happen. As you know, that was delicate and dicey. And as we've done our fourth course, I think has been a resounding success. So very appreciative for everything you did and continue to do with that. Um, so uh, how do you get involved? Okay. So I would not be doing anything at all without two people. Uh, of course, my attendings, I would say are, are pinnacle, but Ty Lu and Mark Hardy, uh, were residents 
and students as I was going through in the late 90s. So Ty um, was an extern with Gerard Yu, whom you know is the current president of the American College of Foot and Ankle Surgeons. So it's funny how this all comes around. Jordan Grossman was a resident. So a lot of these folks I knew back at that time, and they knew even back then that I was you know, incredibly involved as a student and, and different things because of opportunities that had come for me. So uh, I just kept in touch with them. And Mark was a resident when I was a student and I rotated and spent months there at Kaiser with them. So uh, around the time after my fellowship in 2008, 2009, and then I, I was I was reaching out to them like, hey, I'd love to get involved. And I just, you know, they're like, you need a little more seasoning yet because I'd only been out a few years, right? And then after, when 2012 came around, they put me on the education, I think it was around that time, they put me on the Education Scientific Affairs Committee um, because both Ty and Mark had said, hey, you know, I submitted my application. They're like, hey, we really, we need to get Mike involved. You know, he's really, he's not going to go away. In other words, he's going to just keep bugging us, keep calling us to let us in, right? So you have to have connections, right? And and that's the unfortunate thing, but you know, I, I'd like to say that that's not nepotism, right? If you've worked hard and you've done the background training, but oftentimes it's really important that there's someone to make that introduction on your behalf. You know, um, like you and I, you know, uh, we know each other through AO and, you know, you're involved in ABFAS now is that as we get to know each other in different scenarios, that, that sort of, you work with a similar group of people and that gradually that circle begins to grow a little bit. But it's always hard to make that first step. So I know people are constantly saying to us, how do I lecture at ACFAS? How do I get involved? You know, we 2018, we had 80 speakers for our annual scientific conference. This year, we have 175. Over the last uh, three years, we've had more than 20% new speakers each year as we try to really expand that and, and you know kill that idea of the good old boys club. As we build the meeting this year, in fact, just to kind of spread the word, we tasked each moderator to build their session. And the, the ask was, go to the literature and build your session based on the literature, based on current subject matter experts. You know, someone who's published in the last five years. And as a result of that, I think it's 55 to 60% of the talks currently being slated for this coming year are based on current literature or something done within the last few years. So... Uh, that's another way to get people involved is, you know, doing your manuscripts, your research presentation, shaking hands at the meetings, introducing yourself, getting involved in your student clubs, APMSA, uh, being involved through the, uh, maybe as a liaison through the American Board of Foot and Ankle Surgery. You know, we had Grace Jurgill um, out this weekend at our meeting for AO, and she was one of our ABPM, uh, ABFAS uh, liaisons and now she's a resident and she's attending courses but we already know grace we know she's going to be a leader in the future i like how you talk about research i mean if you do enough research it's it's like you're not going away right the more research you do the more invitations you're going to get and it just becomes a snowball well that's an automatic in right if you want to speak at the annual conference hey i've published this paper uh, i'm a subject matter expert give me a chance to expand our profession how do you say no to that the meeting's better. Absolutely. Um, That's the end. Mike, do you mind commenting on Gerard Yu and his influence? We talk about mentors all the time. Um, he's been a mentor to so many people in this profession. Uh, how did he influence you? Yeah, he was an amazing guy. Um, <clears throat> it's interesting, you know, at our AO course, um, we had John Rook there, who obviously with Gerard Yu or some of the early podiatry institute people, he, John Rook was Gerard Yu's residency director. And, you know, many, many giants come, came out of the PI in that era. Uh, people like Luke Ciccinelli, who everybody knows, and, you know, Scott Millay. It was just an amazing group of people. So Dr. Yu was probably one, one of the great minds in foot and ankle at that time. And it's, um, it's kind of unusual. A lot of people now don't know him for, for everything that he did, you know, publishing I don't know, 100 plus papers and editor of the text and stuff. You know, I had the opportunity to work with him in the office and being one on one with such a brilliant person. It was. It was it was life changing. You know, it's funny, Ed, everybody I talk to that's ever worked with Dr. Yu has the same strong feelings as so influential and 
such a strong personality and just brought so much to the profession. Yeah. And so you can see, I get a little emotional. I talk about, you know, cause he passed, he died, you know, but that legacy is there. Absolutely. No, I, I, I appreciate those comments. Um, and I think that's also, sorry, Jeff, but this is also, I think what's so beautiful about trying to capture these living experiences of people who shaped us and having been someone who's gotten emotional speaking about my mentors, it's amazing how it hits you in a way that like, it took me completely by surprise. Um, but to have, have that opportunity to work with someone closely and have them impact your life and then get to share that through your own way with people. So I, I really appreciate you sharing that moment with us, Mike, because those are the things that, to your point, help Gerard, you live through his legacy. He, he's been brought up several times by various people who worked with him. Yeah. He was clearly a leader. And it just, we want, we, we want the world to know these people because they mattered. They created so much good in the world. And how do you, how do you wrap that up? How do you quantify that or celebrate that? And it's in moments exactly like that. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, they're only a generation past most of us, but, you know, sadly in this life, we're only a generation from being sort of not as relevant, right? If, if you, you didn't hear him speak or you didn't know what a genius he was, you just didn't get the benefit of that, right? So people, you know, who continue to pass that knowledge on, you know, um, I think we just all have to be very appreciative of our mentors, you know, for the sacrifice and for the development of the profession and the expansion. You know, Tom Chang is Gerard Yu's cousin. So we're all intertwined. It's like the government. We're all intertwined <laughs> in some way. <laughs> exactly. But hopefully in a very positive way. You know, I can remember being uh, working in Gerard's clinic, uh, you know, as a second year student and Scott Malay being there in clinic with us. You know, he'd come in, he'd have people come in and, uh, you know, be the, the guest for radiology and he'd fly them in and, you know, and then they'd work clinic with us. So having, you know, you know, a young Tom Chang, who was an absolute superstar come, you know, in 1998 and when he was just finished his residency or whatever and work with us and glean all these neat stories from him. It's just incredible. You know, I remember Luke from back when he was, you know, young in practice, Chicken Ellie. I mean, all these guys are, have just been huge mentors. Well, that's fabulous. I think that's a common theme in leaders in any field, not just podiatry. Uh, we all stand on the shoulders of those that came before us. And if they made a difference, it, it stimulates you to make a difference. And and I think that's just been a, a repeated theme, Joe, in all these interviews with leaders in our profession. No, it's great. I'm sorry to get emotional. No, it's all good. I love <laughs> I'm it. I, I, no, emotional I, I, on national national podcasts. But, you know, the, this is the reality is like people impact your life, right? And, yeah. and there are certain people that impact your life and mm -hmm. that'll be with you forever. And it's real. Like... That, that's a real moment right there. So, and I, I appreciate it because you helped me not feel like the only one that gets emotional about my mentor. So if nothing else, Mike, thank you. Thank you for making me feel much, better. <laughs> so Mike, I have a question for you. What do you do when you're not consumed with podiatric medicine? Answer. You know, I love, I love to spend time with my family, right? Because you only get so much time in this life, right? So to all the young people out here, learn the balance. I think your generation is so much better at this. You know, you're all struggling with different challenges, whether it be financial or whatever, but learn to, to make sure that you take care of your family, take care of yourself. I think sometimes I'm remiss about that. You know, this weekend I had Lawrence Ford saying you're going to have a heart attack if you keep this up. Don't be you know, like Dr. You. You know, I, I think you've got to make time for yourself. You've got to exercise. You've got to have fun. I love to travel. We just came back from Italy uh, and Germany. And just every year, I try to plan a big summer trip with my family where it's, you know, 10 to 14 days, totally uninterrupted. Uh, I try to put the cell phone away and and just go somewhere unique. You know, last year we were in Spain, the year before in Greece. So we try to do a really neat trip every year. And, you know, it's, um, I work, I don't sleep a ton and I work late at night. Uh, so that when I come home and after work that I can devote my time to my family and just really dial in on them and try to be present as best as I can. That's always a challenge when you got a lot of irons and the fires being present, but so important, you know, so important that your kids know you're there for them. 
and, especially if you're going to do this stuff that they know they can still count on their dad. Oh, good point. You know, and it just hockey doesn't happen. You got, you got to make it happen. Yeah. I'm Canadian. I love hockey. I, I, I love to play hockey, still play once in a while. Very good. Fantastic. But, uh, that's the, that's the long winded. So on brevity, you know, Joe, Joe said she talks a lot. So do I. So that's why we get along. We're both, we're both verbose to a degree. Hopefully. Poor Ron. He has to listen to both of us. <laughs> Ron, Ray, but I think, I think he'd rather listen to you as he had got a whole earful of me for the weekend, but <laughs> Ron was so well, funny, and, Mike. And kudos to them for de redeveloping all the AO videos. Like this is a huge, huge task that she's taken on over the weekend of starting all that. You know. Well, and huge kudos to Gage. Again, shout out to Gage another faculty that exactly. hopefully at some yeah. point we can get on here. But I mean, the talent, the, the skills and talent, I mean, that's what's that's, so fun about these opportunities is so many incredible people in our profession with yeah, interesting just, skill sets outside of podiatry. That's, I think I'm just a, a more, I've had a better life because of the people that I've met through all this, you know. Well, so. um, I think also, the, one of the most important things is to learn to be a master delegator. Man alive, if I couldn't delegate to the people and have that trusting, trusting network of, of friends and family around that I can say, hey, I'm in a bind. Can you help me with this? Because um, as you know, Joe, as we've done this advanced course, these are heavy lifts to develop these courses for AO or ACFS or whoever it may be. Um, just learning, that took me a long time in life, I think, actually, is just learning to let go a little bit. And, and not feel like you have to control. I, I think I grew up as kind of a control freak. You know, my mom was a concert pianist and, and she was just so dialed into everything and so great. And, and I think I've tried to be a perfectionist too. And you realize, you know what? There are a lot of really highly talented people who can do even better job than I am doing. So that's taken a while to learn, but I'm proud of that. Something do you play? Fun. You know what's funny? I grew up playing but it was always on Saturdays during hockey and soccer. <laughs> and so I can remember sitting there and my mom watching me and, and I just, my heart wasn't in it. And she yeah. only said, you know what, you'll regret it when you're older, you'll, it'll bring you relaxation. You'll enjoy playing. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I want to go play hockey. So <laughs> I don't play as much as I used to. I'm, I'm not very good. I certainly my whole family owns one of the largest music schools in Canada, my aunt and my grandma and grandpa taught there and my mom, everybody, and, you know, they've got 17 odd teachers and, I'm the only one who didn't go down that route. You know, my cousin uh, was an opera uh, performance singer. So it's, yeah, it's in the family. That's incredible. I wasn't good enough. You you channeled your energies elsewhere. I've tried. I've tried. I've got good. a lot to learn and a lot more to do in life. Well, well Mike, the goals. I want to thank you for all you've done to advance our profession and all the leadership roles and all, all the lives you've uh, impacted. Uh, Thank you so much. And Joe and I are going to send you a Dean's Chat cup. We both have our cups. Uh, you can enjoy your beverage of choice uh, there. And thank you so much again for joining us today. Huge honor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And to all of our listeners out there on Apple and Spotify, please give us a five-star rating and leave a couple comments. And if you're watching on YouTube, by all means, become a subscriber. Until next week, cheers, everybody. Cheers. Cheers.